All right, welcome to a new series of videos. In this course, I'm going to teach you all of the skills you need to start working with synths. You're going to learn the basic tools and parameters found in most synthesizers, as well as how to apply them to help modify preset sounds or create your own brand new sounds from scratch. Along the way, I'm going to demonstrate how each tool and strategy can be found in multiple different synths, so you can see firsthand how the basic parameters can be applied across multiple different instruments. In this video, we are going to get started by learning the very basic structure used by all synthesizers, regardless of their type. Then we are going to learn how ADSR envelopes can be used to create four basic types of synths, leads, plucks, pads, and basses. So with that out of the way, let's get started. First up, Nearly every single synth ever made is going to follow three basic steps. Step number one is to start by producing a raw sound. Step number two is to modify that sound. And then step number three is to send that final product to the amplifier so it can be produced. The specific strategies and tools that you can use in each of these steps will vary on the type of synth you use. For example, a sampler is a type of synth that uses a recording, or multiple recordings, for the initial raw sound. That recording can then be looped, manipulated, and changed in any way to create a seemingly brand new sound that can serve any number of new settings. However, each of the synths we'll be using in this series are going to use something called an oscillator to produce their raw sound. An oscillator is a tool that can produce a brand new audio signal, usually in the form of a simple sound wave, like a sine wave or a saw wave, or a more complex signal called a wavetable, which contains a collection of multiple different waveforms that the synth can then smoothly transition between to help create interesting and more complex sounds. We're gonna learn way more about oscillators and wavetables in the next video. But for now, the important thing to remember is that every single synth will start by producing some kind of raw sound. Then it's going to modify that raw sound before finally sending the signal to the amplifier so it can be heard. Now, obviously, each of these steps happens nearly instantaneously, but they're still important to know because they do make for incredibly useful points of reference when creating a brand new sound from scratch. And we can use this process to create all sorts of different synthetic instruments and sounds. For example, today we're gonna to learn how to use the ADSR envelopes to transform a very simple oscillator into four completely different types of synths. This beautiful instrument is called Absynth 6. And the good folks at Native Instruments were kind enough to send me a free copy of this bad boy, and I have been having a blast exploring what it's capable of. There are tons of different presets to be explored. But for now, we're gonna start with a brand new empty patch so we can create our own simple sounds. So step number one is to create the raw sound that we want to work with. And that means setting up our oscillators. So first things first, I'm gonna move up here. I'm gonna hit new preset, which completely resets the synth. And then under the patch window, you'll see that Absinthe 6 has a total of three different oscillators that we can work with. But for now, we only need one. So we're gonna to stick to just oscillator A and leave the other two alone. All oscillators, regardless of the synth you're working with, are going to have a few things in common. And again, we're gonna dive much more deeply in future videos, but for now, we want to focus on just one of these traits, which is the ability to control or select the type of sound that it produces. In Absinthe 6, this can be found under the waveform menu here. As you can see, there are a ton of different waveforms that we can play around with. Some are super simple and traditional, like a triangle wave, and others are much more complex and experimental, like Organ 3. Again, we are going to learn a lot more about this in our next video, and many of the subsequent videos will share additional strategies to help shape the exact kind of raw sound you want much more deeply. But for now, our priority is to just start with a simple sound wave, and we'll move from there. So I'm gonna go with a very simple classic, the square wave. Step number two in sound design is to modify the raw sound so that it better suits the needs of your music. And the very first tool we are going to explore for modifying sounds is something called an amp envelope. An envelope is a type of tool called a modulator. 
Modulators are used to modulate or change some aspect of your sound across time. That's literally all it is. If you ever hear the term modulator or modulation or modulate or something similar in the context of synthesizers and sound design, all it means is something's changing. Most envelopes are going to be built on a very simple ADSR model, which stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. Each of these representing a different phase of modulation. But it's easier to explain if we use an example. So, for example, the amp envelope is a specific type of envelope that applies the ADSR shape to your synth's volume. Phase number one is the attack stage. The attack of your synth refers to how long it takes for your synth to go from silence to its peak volume each time a new note is played. For example, here in AppSynth 6, we have a super cool little feature where you can watch your synth move through the various ADSR stages by following a little white dot that pops up. This first little segment of our envelope is our attack stage. If I set this bad boy to one second long, either by typing it up here or by dragging this little dot to or fro, that means from the moment I press a key on my keyboard or hit play on a MIDI sequence, it will take my synth one whole second to go from silence to peak volume at the start of any new note. I can make this stage last as long or as short as I want within the limitations of the synth itself. Some of them have time limits. It's, it's different for each instrument. But let's make it, say, two seconds long. Nice long attack. Let's try half a second. Much shorter. Or, or we can even do zero seconds for an instantaneous attack. It's just one little parameter. You can already see how it can be used to completely change the personality of your sound. The next stage that we want to look at is the sustain stage. And don't worry, we're not skipping decay. We are going to get back to that in just a second. But after your attack stage hits the peak volume of your amp envelope, it's going to move to something called the sustain. The sustain, as your name suggests, is the volume your synth will maintain, or sustain, for as long as you continue to play the same note. And to help understand the stage, I find it very useful to visualize acoustic instruments. For example, a cello is a sustaining instrument. A cello player can perform almost any note in its range indefinitely. Doesn't matter how long it needs to be. They can just keep playing it constantly without break. Same with instruments like the pipe organ. But a piano. A piano is a non-sustaining instrument. It does not matter how long a piano player holds down a key on their keyboard. The moment they press that key, it immediately starts dying out. And even if you use a sustain pedal to make it last longer, you cannot save it from eventually petering out to silence. The sustain of an amp envelope helps you control which type of instrument your synth is going to be. Is it going to be sustaining? or non-sustaining? Or is it gonna be something in between? If I set the sustain to zero, my synth will be like a piano. It will be incapable of holding a single pitch for too long. The moment it hits that peak in the attack, it immediately starts moving towards silence. If I move that sustain to literally any other level, it's gonna become a sustaining instrument, something like a cello or a pipe organ. As long as I hold that key down, it will continue to play that key. With the caveat that I get to control how loud that sustain level is, ranging from maintaining my peak volume that was hit by the attack phase, all the way to getting super close to silence, but not quite all the way. But regardless of what I do with the sustain, the decay of my amp envelope is just very simply going to control how long it takes for my synth to move from the peak to the new volume set by the sustain. And again, I can set this to any level, like half a second to even somewhere as far as like three seconds. Whatever I want, as long as it works for the instrument I'm working with. The very last stage is the release stage, which is sort of the opposite of the attack. No matter where my synth is in the envelope shape, the moment I take my finger off the keyboard, it immediately jumps to the release stage. 
and the release controls how long it will take for my synth to fade back to silence from whatever volume it's starting at. And again, this can range anywhere from super short to super long. These four little parameters, just on their own, provide nearly limitless ways to modify our super simple little square wave. And the cool thing is you can find these tools in nearly every single synth. For example, here's a classic, Massive by Native Instruments. This synthesizer, like Absinthe 6, has three different oscillators. And you can turn them on with this little button here. You can then select the sound you want from any list of wavetables. The attack envelope looks a little bit different. It has additional options tossed in that you can work with and that you can learn how to use by reading the manual of the synth. But those basic controls are all still there. You can control the attack with this little knob here. You can control the sustain with this little knob right here. The decay is controlled with the decay knob. And of course, there is a release knob. My personal favorite synthesizer to work with is Massive X. Once again, oscillators. They're right here. There's just two of them in this one. You can click your initial raw sound by selecting any number of wavetables. Again, there are multiple controls that we'll learn more about as we progress in the series. But for now, just pick your initial sound. And the amp envelope is down here. Again, it's had a bit of a facelift. There are multiple additional different controls you can work with. If you want to learn them, read the manual, but you don't really have to. The basics are all still right here. Attack knob, sustain knob, decay, and release. Even something like FM8, which uses a completely different type of synthesis called FM synthesis, you can still find the basic ADSR envelope with your attack, your decay, your sustain, and your release. There are nearly limitless ways to apply these tools. But in this series, I really want to focus on learning simple strategies for applying everything you learn. And to help practice this, we're going to get things started out with just four simple categories of sounds, which are pads, plucks, leads, and basses. We're going to learn a lot more about these sounds as this series of videos progresses. But for now, on just what each of these sounds are typically used for and the types of ADSR envelopes they generally have. First up, we have pads. Pads are used to play long sustained chords or similar layers. Since they're used to play chords, they tend to be polyphonic, meaning that your synth can play more than one note at the same time. They also tend to follow a very simple ADSR shape of slow attack, moderate decay, high-ish sustain, and a little bit of a release so that they kind of bleed into each other. These values on the screen are not requirements. They're not dogma, they're not rules, it's nothing like that. These are just recommendations. Start with these values or close enough to these values, and then experiment with how small little tweaks can change the personality of your pads. Plucks are another type of harmonic synth, but instead of playing sustained chords, they typically get used for more rhythmic rules. Things like arpeggios, ostinati, rhythmic chords, etc. They also tend to be polyphonic, and they usually follow a simple ADSR shape of fast attack, short decay, zero sustain, and if necessary, a very short release. This shape makes them perfect for rapid rhythmic rolls. Again, the values on the screen are just simple starting points to play around with, and then make small tweaks to see how small little adjustments can have big impact on the personality of your sounds. Leads tend to be among the most complex types of synths, and we're going to learn a lot about leads moving forward. But they're basically a catch-all category for any instruments designed to perform melodies or other melodic type layers. As such, usually they tend to be monophonic, meaning that they only play one note at a time, which is pretty fair if you consider most of the instruments that play melodies, things like flutes, trumpets, singers, that usually only play one note at a time. And the important thing about leads is they tend to have all kind of modulators and modifications attached. 
But for now, in terms of ADSR envelopes, they can follow pretty much any shape that you need them to. But they do tend to gravitate towards fast to medium attacks, short decays, medium sustains, and short releases. As a little tip, as you try creating leads, I recommend thinking of a specific melodic instrument that you're trying to emulate. Whether it's something like a trumpet, or a singer, or a violin, or really anything. Having an image in mind of what kind of performance you want will help go a long way to shaping the different decisions you make while making your synth. Finally, basses, as the name suggests, typically play the bass lines. They will also tend to be mostly monophonic and will usually be built around a fast attack, a medium decay, minimal sustain, and a short release. But as an alternative, you can also use pads to perform more sustained long bass lines if you'd like. But with that, we've reached the end of the first video in this series. And at the end of each video, I will be providing you with a short checklist of the different things we've learned that you can try applying to any synthesizer you happen to be working with. And today, that list includes these items. You can pick up any synthesizer. And if you identify how to control each of these little items, you will be well on your way to creating new and exciting sounds. A special thanks goes out to my patrons, channel members, and to the good folks at Native Instruments for sharing a copy of their new instrument, Absinthe 6, with me. You can use the affiliate link in the description of this video to grab a copy of Absinthe 6 or my personal favorite synth, Massive X, or really any of their great instruments so that you can help follow along with the rest of this series. So until next time, my friends, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music. I will see you in the next video.